So we're going to go on now in with this cow skull, and we're going to work on uh, this section here, cow skull, this Christmas ball, this shadow in in through here. So and you can work back to front. I like to talk about you know that with my students, especially in the painting. Uh, but we tend to seem to be working right to left, which is fine too, especially since we have a quick sketch in there as well. You always want those degrees of separation of objects. What's forward, what's middle ground, and what's background. And the, the background will be a little bit lighter, will fade off, and be less intense in contrast in terms of contour line than your foreground objects. So keep that in mind. So we'll move on to... Uh, the particulars now of this cow skull, this uh, bone of the cow in the rows and side and sector and so on. And so we've got this particular structure in here, kind of the nodule, the condyle of this bone, I suppose. I'm not exactly sure. It doesn't matter. And you can see how boxy it is. It's very square in terms of its plane and through here. So we're going to kind of work through this region. <clears throat> Try to keep my head out of the way as much as I can so I can focus in tight on it. So we're coming up. The trick is to draw and taper if you need it, but also be very sensitive to change, right? But, but then again, to be open to possibilities of variation, hand pressure, you name it. <clears throat> so we're curving down this bone and through here. <clears throat> and through it, it kind of comes on the inside. So you can see with my quick sketch, I have already have a place to go. Sometimes you won't have that, and you have to slow it down even further and think through the forms even more methodically and quickly, which I think is a challenge. Again, we talked about David Hockney in his pen and ink contour line drawings. He did drawings of some of his famous friends, Warhol, etc., some critics that were meticulously drawn without a quick sketch but a little bit looser and fresher too than here. This is a pretty tight meticulous uh, kind of contour line and it's meant for early students in drawing but of course for anybody and to really slow your vision and your perception down. So get in front of as many still life objects in front. Now we're working from a projection for demo purposes, but if you can, get in front of the live three-dimensional form. Always push for that as much as I can. So there's that rose. The outline is going to be in through here. I'm going to come back and now grab the under, under part of this bone in the three-dimensional plane in through here. So sometimes I start away from the end. Sometimes I start at the end. It really doesn't matter to me. I think it's important to know that where you start with it is, is less important. That may not be always true of each particular drawing that you do, but having the quick, quick sketch structure helps for sure. I'm working the edge of it. It's kind of bony platelet like feeling. Trying to notice as much as I can as contour edge. And it's, again, it's kind of, you can see it's tilted down this way. And so I'm keeping that in mind. I'm kind of in where the table touches 
the back so it overlaps that table and do here. And I always make that a little bit darker in front where it overlaps so we can get that sense of depth. You want your forward objects to come forward. So I can feel my quick sketch, but I'm not really that interested in where it's at anymore. I'm looking at the object that I'm drawing to make sure some of my quick sketches are guide. And later on, some of these quick sketch lines will show up, and I'll go back with my eraser, and I'll just, I'll just take those out. And by the way, if you're working with a Wacom tablet, this process could be totally the same. It won't change. I would say if you're just learning to draw, get off the Wacom tablet as much as you can and come back to it later. Um, do it, you know, have fun on your own, but if you can draw traditionally first and get those sensibilities there first, um, I think you'll be better off. However, I will say that drawing is a mental exercise in that no matter what tool you're really using, if you can get some of the best instruction from wherever you're getting, and I'm not just talking about me for sure, I'm talking about um, excellent, you know, well-trained and professional artists that are working. It, it transfers into all tools, but I just feel like that's for a start. Getting in front of as many uh, natural objects as you can, live, the live model, live objects, the better. Um, I think working from photographs and, and reproductions is great too as a supplement, but especially in the beginning if you can get in front of the live model, I think it's it's a benefit. It's hard. It's harder for sure. But then you know there's a there's an opposite reaction to that and from an artist that you might know that's pretty world famous. You may have heard of uh, Peter Paul Rubens. And he talked about that in a document I read not too terribly long ago, who, who when he was younger and artists, when, when training with artists, they did not get in front of the figure because it would, the figure moved, the lighting changed so often, and so they worked from reproduction solely. So, you know, there's some validity to that. Um, and so working for master copy reproductions, I think, is, is vitally important if you can do that. However, you tend to be stylistically stunted for a contemporary artist in the 21st century. So that, that would be the only thing I would be mindful of. But you know, I thought that was an interesting comment from him. And then, of course, later on, when a young student or pupil had matured into a young adult artist, at whatever time frame that was, of course, they went to the live model. So some of the beginning was done by copying and making tracings from the master's drawings. So I think that's pretty, pretty interesting revelation. Don't you think? I think that's pretty in line, especially from somebody as, as great as as Peter Paul Rubens is and was and has during his lifetime. In my opinion, he's he's at the top of the list of the greatest figurative draftsmen of all, all time, traditional kind of draftsmen. I like a lot of different types of expressive drawing, but in terms of the traditional Baroque these, you know, slash Renaissance uh, drawing, his the dynamic, the dyna dynamism, I suppose, if that's the right word, is, is unrivaled. Unrivaled. I think he's is amazing. If you ever get a chance to go to the Louvre, you'll see an entire Rubens room of large, giant, uh, commissioned uh, paintings of his that are just breathtaking um, and renowned for their 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 grand uh, draftsmanship. So, in in I am by no means a traditionalist or a um, Renaissance type follower. Uh, I was trained as a fine artist and illustrator in Los Angeles, and that's part was part of our study. And then we also uh, looked a lot at contemporary work. So if you look at my work, I you can find my website. I'll plug myself once here: www.markleone.com. M a r c l e o n e dot com. And you'll see that I my work is con contemporary art practice of un orthodox painting materials and it has a connection to geologic and tectonic activity okay so working so there you go with that um, there's a plug for myself how about that how narcissistic is that oh well but again getting back to Rubens and drawing draw from 
life as much as you as much as you possibly can. How did I learn to draw? I learned to draw when I was a child. I just started drawing, and I liked sports, so I would draw sports action uh, from photographs. I would draw cars, and I would draw trucks and people, and and mostly from magazines. Right in my head, I would create my own video games. Um, or, or board games as well, actually. And I spent a lot of just time when I wasn't outdoors, just drawing and lock, locking myself in my room and drawing quite a bit. And it just kept evolving uh, from there. So it wasn't a traditional way to draw in the beginning. And then I, I started training in, back in Texas for a while, and then I moved to Los Angeles. and studied at Art Center College of Design and that really started to put it all together. And I had some wonderful instructors there. Steve Houston, Harry Carmian, Glenn Vilpu, Bob Cotto, Dwayne Harmon, excuse me, Dwight Harmon. Uh, gosh, just lucky to to have been there. David McCarsky. These, these people really helped to open me up to the possibilities of of what Art and good craftsmanship and drawing could be a good design. Norm Schurman. And then I did my MFA at Arizona State, which was great too as well. So I'm working this bone, this cow bone inside here. I'll start to come inside, but I feel like I want to get this edge first before I jump into some of this. <clears throat> Just to kind of get a little bit of my boundaries and make sure I'm I'm progressing nicely. So sometimes I'll skip. I can see in my mind where this line is going. And sometimes I'll skip back here and I'll see where the end of this cow bone, it kind of tips up. Because <clears throat> my quick sketch was pretty accurate in this sense. And I'll catch a little bit of this line in through here and kind of come up. <clears throat> and then back over. <clears throat> Cascade, start to cascade down here a little bit. <clears throat> so if you can get to a place where you can study, if you can, if you have, this is your second career, your hobby, I get a lot of really nice, cool emails from <clears throat> probably young at heart adults. And this is their second career, that's okay. These videos are for you guys too. These are for my students at NKU, but for the entire community, whoever wants to watch them. Um, and so these are for you to help learn and grow and, and do something really provocative, hopefully an instinct, and continue to be a continuing uh, student. And again, I think there's a, I have a lot of cool colleagues here at the university and other universities that I that know it, that teach drawing and painting, but there's a lot of, I think a lot of really good instruction online. Check it all out. Subscribe to a lot. But be careful for people who, who tell you uh, how to draw this or how to draw that. I think there are many different ways to express that which drawing can describe the universe. So be careful of that. Be careful of these so-called academies. I think that's, that's um, a little dangerous. I would be mindful of that as well. So I'm a little long in through here, but I don't care. It's okay. I'm not perfect with my contour line drawing. And I can interpret and change a little bit. I think that's what happens with most artists, too, is we interpret maybe our mistakes. Maybe I'm a, I'm a little bit long in through from here to here, but I'm okay with it. This length seems to be fine. And at the end of the day, when the still life is gone and your audience looks at your still life, they don't really care. If it's a really large mistake, like, again, if you bring the nose way down here or the lip way over, we've got a problem. But for here, I think we're okay. So I'm a little long there. I've made several little tiny mistakes. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Even if something is kind of even more strict as, as contour line, I think that's, that's all right. But get, see a lot of different drawing, a lot of different lessons, 
you'll have your own heroes, I suppose, um, and that's and that's fine. Meaning heroes, meaning art, historical people who you admire, you might come back to uh, often to to see and relate to. So I'm going to come down this cow skull in through here on this side and over. And there might be a leaf overlapping. I could erase through there a little bit later. Or not cow skull, cow bone. Whatever it is. So again, if you get bored with this section, go on to another one. Fast forward. I do that a lot to find cool areas. But it's for I'm trying to record all this. I know it's going to be a long one. But I think that's okay. But I want you to see it all, and then you can gather what you want from it, come back from it at different times. So I'm going to come down the, the cow bone in through here. And it gets kind of rocky and jaggedy. I'm not going to get all that, but I'm going to interpret it. We're interpreting, and that's okay. Little dots and dashes. And it's kind of a darker, it's got a probably a little bit darker line weight on this side because here's a light side over here, right? Darker side over and through this kind of region. start to come down, it starts to sit down about right here. And so I'll now jump in on the inside. Right in through here where that opening is. So I've got that rose, the edge of that rose about right in through here and over. And we'll move it downward and turning it. It's kind of its oval round, roundish nature in through here. And it opens and turns. <clears throat> and then it's got a little bit of extra and down and through here with the pedal. Extra pedal lip turning. So I found that boundary so I can kind of come back over and through here and grab that over this opening of the cow skull, cow bone. So who are your favorite artists? Who do you admire the most currently? What do you know about art history? So to become a good student of drawing and good student of painting, no matter what your, your purpose, be a good student of art history in the history of your profession. If you're a designer or if you're an entertainment designer or if you're an illustrator, the history of illustration or the history of uh, sculpture or ceramic, clay, um, art history in general, architecture, wherever you're at, in whatever you do, try to be a good steward of that, a good student of that. <clears throat> and I think that will pay dividends. Not because you can wax philosophical and say pseudo-important stuff like myself, <laughs> so that you can be informed about 
good artistic aesthetic choices. Where we come from and where we get the technical and intellectual uh, historical boundaries, I suppose, if you will, are important or the range of where we have evolved to and where we can possibly go to are really important. That's what I'm really trying to say in a fancy, fancy schmancy kind of way. So some arbitrary contour lines. Sometimes when I have a soft curve, I'll do that. Then I have a harder, a harder form and cast shadow, bony kind of area. And then a cast shadow on the other side. And I'll break that up a little bit to try to show that. Because we're only working in line. And sometimes the lines get very short into almost little dots and dashes. A dot can be a very short line. <clears throat> So now I've got the boundaries of that. So I'm, I'm a little wide in through here. I think I'm going to erase right in through here because I think I have a. I can correct this one pretty easy and take this out. And I'm going to there we go. I'm going to narrow that out a little bit. <laughs> right in through here. So I'm going to come in further with this line right in through here. Bring, make it a little bit more dynamic. So I can bring it in right in through here and it gets that kind of wavy platelet look right in through this area. And then it starts to come out wider again through here. <clears throat> and then it comes on over and out a little bit there. I think that's a better representation, don't you? A little bit of, of what that was. That's better. Don't be afraid to change those. Make, make those changes. Uh, I see students kind of get like, well, it's just too hard to, to make the change. Make the change. When you notice it early, make it make it then as much as you can. Sometimes, I, you know, I live with my mistakes, too. Little bitty mistakes on the breastplate. Don't worry about that if they're minor. But if you can change a, what I thought was a relatively major one, and you'll have to make the call yourself. I thought that was worth it. A little contouring, cross-contouring through here. Just to get the inside starting to work. Lighter line. This kind of has an eye socket feel, doesn't it? Underneath. Back up. <clears throat> so let's get into a little of this detail of this turn as it's moving. These little bone stress striations, whatever these are, kind of fan like and out. So the dark, the bottom line is a little bit darker because it's opposite the light source. It's got a ridge on top through here. over and through here a little bit and then through <clears throat> so we've got now as I'm as if we're working up a little bit you can see where 
we've got the end of this cloth about right here and it straddles over to about right here. It's kind of curving in this direction. A little quick guideline there. So see again when I made that mistake that's a better representation I think. And then we can start to move here with that cloth. Softer feeling through that. And then right in through here, I'm gonna make this a little darker where this form, I want this part of the cow skull to come, the cow bone to come forward up and through. <clears throat> and this kind of comes underneath. And then you've got this secondary cast shadow from the fold here through, kind of down. And underneath as that folds through, and I think we've got enough in through here to tell that story enough. And we'll let the less the rest of it kind of fade off, maybe just a little bit darker in through there. And then again maybe not looking at it, it might be a little dark, so I can take my needed eraser. Dab at that. I want that to sit back a little bit. So we're, we're not drawing and painting and looking at value in an, an exclusive larger sense, but we're looking at it in a line sense. So I've got to push that background, you know, further back. So I've got my table here emerging. <clears throat> and I don't want to keep this line weight the same. want to vary it. And it might look the same. And I'm not even looking at the still life. I'm just kind of relating to what I know about line. We've got to hover it. We've got to change it. Line is in a constant state of movement and flux across objects. And it doesn't stay the same for very long at all. So our line weight, our line work, our hand pressure changes constantly to reflect those alterations or those dynamic changes that light give us. So line weight will never stay the same. Unless you're doing something expressive or mechanical or like a coloring book, then that line weight is going to fluctuate, or excuse me, not fluctuate at all. It will stay the same. And if it stays the same for very long, it will start to flatten. So graphic artists, graphic People, you want your work to look very graphic. That that will be the case, too, as well. So you have to know what kind of line you want to make the expression you want. So getting these form shadows or cast shadows, excuse me, on the back of the of the wall here, coming over. And I'm also a proponent if you and if you need to to draw with changing your drawing board 360 degrees around. It's harder for me to do that with a camera on to show you it would be a constant nightmare of editing. But if I were drawing this uh, outside of the camera for demonstration purposes, I would definitely be changing my body position with the change of the paper. I think that's important. So turning it 360. So I've got this little cast shadow and through here opening up and then it falls away all the way through 
and over to here. So it comes across the up and it disappears a little bit right in through here. And it starts to come off the table, or come onto the table, excuse me, rather, right in through. Up. And through there. And then we kind of, we're starting to go at a diagonal. Right in through. And I can bring that, that ball is going to be right in through here. So you can see the space between where that ball is to here is a little wider. So what do I do? Do I erase all this and I bring it up? Or do I bring the ball up and not overlap? Or do I make the ball bigger? Uh, I think I'll just make the ball bigger because I like the way it's going to overlap this little device in through here. So you can alterate and change, alter, excuse me, and change that which you're drawing to fit what you need. A little bit harder to do that with the figure, but I'm just going to take the liberty of altering it. <clears throat> I hope this, this video in that sense too demonstrates how flexible you, you can be in the to your vision and you don't have to be a slave to what you're drawing as long as it fits within the aesthetic parameters of what you want. Alright, so we've got that cast shadow sitting down there. So now we can go for that ball. And I'm going to make that ball bigger. And we're going to put it, let's see, oh, about how big. So I'm going to overlap it a little bit more for cooler effect. I think it'll be better. And that will bring it up to where that tilt, or excuse me, where that almost touches that uh, cast shadow from the. Caesar sculpture, so right in through here, so we'll make it a little bit bigger, which is no big deal. So there's my, my quick sketch, and we'll jump in on, on that ball. <coughs> so it's a pretty round object, so we're going to get the sense of that round feel. <clears throat> and the light source is hitting it from the middle left, excuse me, middle right. It's a little darker in through here where it's coming into the cast shadow. It starts to fade off there, so that highlight is going to be right in through here. <clears throat> and I'll come around and catch this edge of the ball in through this area. This area of our plastic tubing, our plumbing pipe, here a little darker, so we can feel that where it goes, the ball goes in behind it. To get that sense working. Come on top of the ball a bit and through here 
And I'm going to start to break up my line a little bit and vary it and change. I don't want it to feel too much like an outline. So I might even start to come in and catch this cast shadow back behind and through here. <clears throat> And taper it downward. It would actually meet up and touch the ball about running through here, but that's going to be overlapped just a little bit. So again, I'm drawing what I am perceiving as well as Ad living a little bit because I've moved the ball and made it a little bit bigger to be more congruent with what we're perceiving. When I made some small minor errors in scaling. And I think you're always in a constant state of making errors and adjusting and arranging space. That's what makes drawing so hard, I think, in painting. There's really nothing easy about any of them. And so we're coming into this phase now where we're going to hit this ball, this chrome looking sort of ball. We'll come over to the top. I'll hit this top a little bit and I'll fade this line through. <clears throat> and now we want to start to feel the highlight. The highlight's pretty pretty bright. That means that the local value of the ball, which is grayish, chromish, reflective, is dark. So the outline of the highlight is pretty high, but it's it's a little you can tell it's a little fuzzy. Well, how do you get that? Well, the way I interpret it is to have a darker line but break up the line enough so that the border is not so hard edged. And I have to contrast that with the hard edge of the ball, especially in the darkest areas, like right in through here to make that feel, you know, worthy of, of, uh, of that, uh, the contrast between that. So I've got that, and I'll start to work that ball now, some of the reflectivity of this object coming through here. That kind of darker area. So you have a limited tool, so you do know that. And so that means that you are limited in the amount of texture and the illusion of gloss that you can get. So it's not, it's not as easy as we would have it if we had full value, right? And so I've got this little divot. Part of the Christmas ball, I suppose. Socket for the hanger. Goes. Mm. That gets broken in there. So now we've got our ball set in. And so I tried to be as true to what I could do with our light line and darker line. And I can get a little bit more in through here. You're kind of contouring and outlining these ending patterns of where the, the light is. And down and through there. And maybe a couple of 
carve arbitrary contour lines just to give it a roundness. A little darker to here. Okay. So I'm at the point now where um, when I left off with you, I uh, went ahead and took the liberty to, to get more done here. I took and drew in some of the wrinkles on the table of the, the cloth that's laid over the table, also in the background and some, some more detail in through here, just to expedite the process a little bit so I can we can move forward some and take on the rest of the still life in through here. The antler, the, uh, the three liquor bottles, and the, the floral uh, grass type structures coming out of the, the liquor bottle as well as the, uh, the leaves in through here. And then finishing it off, I'm going to make the focal point uh, a little bit of a rendering right here in the face and in the background area, just in this one little area to kind of bring everything to a resolution with just a little bit of value and light, light and dark rendering and shading, if you will. Okay, so that's what we're going to hit now. All right, so let's take on these last remaining objects here in the composition. And let's begin uh, to handle them. So I think what I'll do is I'll take on the three bottles and work my way out from there and then fill in the rest of uh, the background too uh, as well. So I've, again, I've taken the liberty to, to go a little bit beyond what um, I shot on the camera just so I can expedite a little bit and make the video a little bit uh, shorter because it's already going to be pretty a pretty long video as well. All right, so I think I'll start in and we'll tackle this uh, <clears throat> antler first that's sitting down on the table and kind of work our way through. So again, you see it, it's kind of claw-like or finger-like and I've gestured in or quick step sketched in the rhythm of you know, what's happening here, what's happening in through here, and then what's happening down in through here. So it is kind of a, a, a claw-like open hand in that sense. It's really strange that way. And of course the shadow moves uh, in this direction as well. It's pretty nice uh, <clears throat> lit uh, antler coming through there. So let's uh, now work with the contour part of it. So again, remember to protect your hand. Use a piece of paper or something to uh, Get yourself protected from from smearing all over your your paper if you can. All right, so I think I'll start here at the top of the antler and through this region. <clears throat> I'm moving through here this arch at the top. Right in through there, and it's a bony kind of calcified structure. So overall, it might be a little darker, a little heavier. It's hard to get the texture of objects, but we want to work on the illusion of that texture, the illusion of bony calcium deer deer antler. Being here in Ohio, we have a lot of a lot of deer. <clears throat> Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky area that we're in. We have a lot of deer, a lot of <clears throat> opportunity to collect antlers from time to time. So we have a lot at the university here. So I have this, this antler section kind of foreshortened coming at us. Then we see the shaft. So I'm getting the width of it right in through here. It comes, kind of comes down. <clears throat> Again, we're not rushing it. This is a long-term meticulous drawing. I've tried to show you as much as I can. I think you can, what's most important about what I'm showing you in eliminating some, some of it so I can shorten this video up a little bit to keep, you, keep your attention. But again, use this video wisely. Come back to it. Um, go on, watch others, and watch sections of what I'm drawing. Some may be relevant to you, some may not. I love YouTube, and I use it for <clears throat> maybe other areas besides art. And, and I go through and I watch the sections of videos that, that I, I may need to get and then kind of get out, and that's fine, too. I understand. And so that's fine. <clears throat> 
so that works. There, so we're coming around. <clears throat> and moving through here with our antler. A little tip of it there. It's pretty much in dark, kind of a darkness in that kind of shadow. It's got a little texture coming through. <clears throat> Showing through there. And then we'll start to come up the shaft up as, as it curls around and through here. So you kind of think of it as hands. There's no different really from this than hands. It's going to be like long, kind of monstrous skeletal hands or vampire hands, maybe, if you will. So we're coming down <clears throat> the first shaft of this antler bone in through here. <clears throat> and getting that tube. Remember, I'm thinking about a, a cylinder. So it's tube-like and running around like a tube and kind of twisting and turning. And it's bone, so it's got a lot of torque to it. All bones have a lot of torque and twist, and even these antlers, which are exposed bone, I suppose, or something close to it. So we'll catch that antler. Yeah, it turns in a little bit. Don't be afraid to go inside really quickly as you're drawing on the outside the contour and the outline <clears throat> contour line again is not just an outline but it's a descriptive drawing tool drawing concept to grab all of it to grab both of it inside and outside the figure should be you should be undulating in and out as you can <clears throat> Point into there. <clears throat> so we're making that clear, rendering that out. I might even start with the cash shadow. It kind of this back part lifts off the table. Can you see it a little bit? So this cash shadow comes through a little bit, and you can see a little little touch of it. So I want to make it a little bit lighter, even though it, you think it's would be darker, but the shadow is not quite as dark as that tone here. So I'm going to finish these other antler parts coming up and over. This kind of turns like this, so we'll make a little arbitrary contour, cross contour through there. <clears throat> kind of through, and then we can start to go underneath. Always want to keep that arching rhythm. This moves all the way over. It kind of this this part connects all the way over to there, but we're going to make a stop in between there and catch this part of the antler here. <clears throat> and then coming down. 
down. And it kind of gets a nice tension point through here that starts to change direction. And I'll move my body over a little bit and change. You can kind of hear my chair clinking around as I'm moving my body around to get the best point of view. I normally might turn my paper 360 like we talked about, but for the camera's sake, I can't. It would be too difficult to, to do. So, <clears throat> this will have to work a little bit harder, but that's okay. I'm here to work hard for this channel. So this comes down. And through this kind of a triangular platform and through here, and then we break right here, and we come down further. And this one, this one arches up a little bit, do like a finger, like a pinky, and this one curves downward, downward. <clears throat> So this one curves and I'm shooting for here. Sometimes I'll put a point where I'm going to shoot for, for right through here. And then coming down. point here and a little highlight here I can kind of get kind of a little oval just to signify that get that point where it touches the table right in through there. This one doesn't touch there's a separation and this shadow comes right right to it and through there. Alright so let's get the other one. So this one's gonna come out wider than what I had for my quick sketch. <clears throat> Kind of like web chicken feet in a way. Okay. So I get this line moving out. It's my exploratory contour line that I can alter. And I keep it lighter, kind of a medium or a lighter thickness too. And start to bring it downward. So I'm thinking in my mind about the thrust of this line about its direction and gesture. Part of it's done for me. I still have to keep that in mind. down. So we're well on our way here. <clears throat> then it starts to scoot out for a little bit. down this direction and we're getting close to this end. It's kind of curled like a tube. It's a little bit more blunt so it ends a little bit more bluntly like so. There we go. A little darker here where it touches.
Okay. So we're on our way there. Then I can bring this antler over since it overlaps a little bit. It actually come to, came together decently. <clears throat> And now we'll draw the shadow underneath it, the cast shadow that uh, is created by the light source on top of it. Mm. So we've got the shadow moving through here. As Nick and Eric walk by. So I filmed these in my nice university office with good good lighting equipment, desk equipment, so but we're next to the offices so it gets a little loud at times. Gives a nice character, right? Not alone. Alright, so we're working with our shadow. We want the shadow to wind up right there and through there, so we'll arch it. A little bit coming down. <clears throat> and we'll touch that tip through here and then back around. So probably a little bit narrower in through here, could have been even wider. It's okay. I think if you when we look back at the entire composition, there are parts that are not completely accurate. I don't think I ever am. I don't know a lot of people who are uh, with contour like this. And a good interpretation is, is to be expected. And interpretation is important. We're doing a drawing and we're not making a <clears throat> copy from a still life. Really hit that where they touch it real nice and hard, nice and dark where it sits down. Of course, this one we won't because it's standing up a little bit, and then I can bring in cloth. Across it for folds. In some of these folds I make up, I make it hopefully a little bit better than what I see. <clears throat> and in some of the folds I don't, I draw exactly what's there. So I'm, I'm using a little artistic creative license, not a whole lot in this observational drawing, but I do ad lib when I want to some. That you, you should uh, rely on too as well. The more experience you get, the better you get uh, at, at living and adding to it, and actually making better than than maybe what you're observing. Your observation, your objects can lie to you if the lining is strange or the perspective is strange, um, depending on your point of view. So keep that in mind too. Artists change at their needs or their their wants for a purpose. You're not a slave to it. But if you're drawing this antler and it looks like an air balloon, then we've got you've got a problem. So I'd say I'm 95.6% accurate, 96.7.25, right, accurate. What I mean by that is I got the spirit of it pretty well, but maybe the sum of the space between is a little off, maybe the angles, this could be a little bit more art. It's okay, it's okay. That part's fine. And so we'll take this shadow and move it down through and end it off about right in through there. Okay. So now I'm going to go ahead and finish this table, this side table off. And let you see that. You want to you want to get that feeling that <clears throat> the table is falling and then falling downward, right? So whoop, and it goes down. I'll do a little bit of the 
you see this little fold in through here from the antler of, on the table. And generally it's a connection of two closely aligned lines that are not touching to get a fold. One's going to be darker than the other. Usually the bottom one away from the lines, it turns away. This one gets a little overlapped and moves in this direction. You can break it apart. I get a feel for the line. And then I start to draw it. I don't get every one. There's not, I don't get every fold in through here. I don't need it quite frankly. There's too much. Uh, let it be a drawing. Let it be a little bit simpler. And that's fine too. But I'll get this line in through here. And they cold together. A little bit darker at the bottom mostly. And they can break apart. Gather a little bit. And they start to form in total connection uh, folds. Little tiny creases or folds on the surface of the table, which is what we're looking for. So let's get this, this turned down as I'm working it through. And so there's some ad-libbing going on in through here. I know that I want this table to turn away and turn downward. Can you see that in the camera? Yeah, you can pretty well. All right. <clears throat> and and so it's got, this line's got to be darker as this tabletop goes in this direction and all of a sudden it turns down. So I want to emphasize that as much as I can without copying everything. And so I know that this line here, as I move across, will eventually have to be dark enough. But I don't want to keep it a straight line. Why? Because the, 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 the cloth is... It's got little little minutia, folds, etc. It breaks apart. Where the light hits, it skips across. And that's important to get. And I want to get that sensation. But ultimately, it's got to be the darkest, co collectively, the darkest line or collect collection of lines together to show that it's a big major uh, plane change. And then everything from it flows downward in shadow. So that's hard to read and hard to get. And so that we can find, because you don't have a lot of information through there. I kind of I zoomed in on it in, in, uh, on my view, and I'll have it for you now too. And so you don't get a whole lot of detail in there, but you get enough. You don't want in your drawing huge areas of just white. And the reason why it becomes a dead area, because there's nothing there large area, but you do need some rest areas, like you have a rest area to, to, to go in a full view, you have a rest area here, you have some rest area here, and then we have to work this area of our composition in terms of getting enough interest in through here, even though it's more open, the difference between the spotlight, the difference between the, the shadow, that's going to be important to get, and so uh, we'll have to work that, and then also a little bit of marks, etc. on the wall. We just do enough of that to hold our attention as a tertiary read, as a third or fourth read, so we won't come back to that too often, but we always come back to our focal point. I think that's really worth talking about uh, too as well, is the manipulation of these barren parts of your drawing that um, that need just enough attention to give a backdrop to the most important part, which we'll come back to as our focal point. So getting back to this table here, this top, the side thickness of the table ends about running through here. You can subtly see it in the folds. And so I want to make an issue of, I've kind of made an issue of it and through here. <clears throat> and I'm going to start to fold some trending downward some of these folds very lightly in just a few kind of skipping across and then diagonally back and through here to pull my viewer this way and hopefully get them to see here and come up and back around too as well I think that's important just enough information Pull down a few more folds and through here. And I'm starting to ad lib a little bit, just riffing off of what I know about folding and turning, just to give a little completion. This is this is 
I don't know how to describe it. Just making sure that you get enough creases in turning. I think I want to make this kind of an open, more of a shape, just for a crease. And just be about enough to come through. And I'll just, in this corner, put a stress point on some of this line a little bit darker in that corner to force your eye through. Take you on a journey through here, a limited journey. It's not as exciting as up and through here, but enough of a journey to get you and then get you back up and through to here to the Campari bottle and to the floral stuff and through here that we've got. So, you know, again, make sure that you're drawing your shadows. I mean, I made a, made a point of showing you that, but you want to make sure that you get those cast shadows. Otherwise, your drawing looks flat. It looks, the physics of light don't work. It's like, why isn't this working? Well, you, you haven't got, you haven't put the objects completely down. They don't, they're not casting shadows. They're like, um, they're like vampire objects. They don't have a reflection, so we want a shadow here. To create a shadow, I think that's important. So make sure you get your cast shadow. So we have a fold here. And this gets a little darker up and through here. Okay. So as we're tackling now these <clears throat> other wine bottles and this uh, rose floral kind of pattern, we'll jump in through, through here. So I can see the quick sketch in through here, you can see it show up. It's pretty light, it's just a gesture. So it gives me enough of a read where I can start to jump in through here and start to take on the red part of the flower, the leaves. leaves. So I've got that lock, locked in. So we get these kind of leafy, leafy patterns in through here. And then I'll start it on this kind of floral arrangement through here. It's really, really dark, so I'm going to keep it very simple. It's not an important part of the composition, but it, it's not without its merits. So I'm going to start to just simply get a feel for the silhouette of these leaves. I'm going to keep it, since I don't see a lot of uh, detail in them and to keep them fairly silhouetted and simple, meaning more just an outline with a little bit of information inside. And so we'll come across here. Okay, and we'll move this across. I kind of see this, I think I see it. It's really dark, a dark red rose. Hopefully you see that. This kind of circular part, so it gets oval-like. Its flower structure looks something like this as we go around. <clears throat> so this is a point where it is mostly an outline, but I am gonna put a little bit inside what I can see and then what I could add lib for a leaf. I'll put this in. And I'll keep it fairly light because it's in within the shadow. You think it'd be dark, but this tells you the darkness around it tells you it's dark. So if you can't see a lot of detail, there's a lot there's a not a lot of contrast, and so that means that you won't make these lines very contrasty. Like for instance, in through here, I might put just the undulating another rhythm in through here and that would be it. Maybe a little bit more in there. And 
that's enough through here. And we'll get the downward part of this. Seems to be another one. It's another leafy part through here. <clears throat> and so you can tell where I've got one more of these to go and it would run off the table. Um, I could keep it on or I could run it off. Running it off is kind of a nice option actually. I'll do that and just, just ad lib it. Don't worry about that if you're a little off. I hope I've made that case crystal clear. It's not a big deal. I can make this a little bit bigger. Maybe this table be, could be pushed out. The difficulty here is is that we get a quick sketch and we're so slow with our line weight that sometimes we it's harder for us to correct uh, holistically or overall. And so you just you go with a little bit of what you might think is a uh, mistake. It's no big deal. So I'm going to take the size of this organic green leafy flower here and just keep the same size but let it run off the excuse me the table in kind of an interesting way so I'll bring it over and down and through and then just kind of get its shape it's almost like a handshake hand shaking here the fingers they're all together this is the thumb kind of sort of <clears throat> Maybe this could be a little flatter, but it's okay. Yeah. And you bring this down, up and over, and we get that shape in through there. And I'll just kind of leave it. I won't put too much inside of it, keep it simple, and this can come over. And so it overlaps a little bit. And of course, this has a cast shadow under here. All right, so we've got that that part laid down. So we're going to get these sort of stocky stems over and through here. A couple little lines in through here, maybe a little, little leaf sticking through. And then let's get these lines in through here. And then up and over. This kind of mimics the the flow, the rhythm of the antler, and through here. Right in through there. All right. So now let's go on to liquid bottles. <clears throat> 